So can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, super great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and kind of walk you through uh, some of the things that the National Trust has been uh, focused on in terms of modernism, and then uh, more specifically some of the things the magazine has been focused on. Although uh, the magazine is the magazine of the National Trust, we also operate a bit autonomously um, and explore some of uh, the topics that we think members are, are particularly interested in or the editorial staff is interested in and they don't always necessarily align directly with uh, organizational interests. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and then I'll get back over to you with some uh, information. Okay, can everyone see that? No, no. You didn't do the screen share. Screen share that. And can you see that now? Yes. Great. So uh, one of the primary things that, uh, at least for us at the National Trust, spawned the idea of doing a modernism Google Hangout was the cover story that we did um, really about the state of modernism. Uh, the loss of Prentice, uh, while it galvanized many modernist uh, 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 acolytes. acolytes. It, it also, also was a sort of a landmark moment for us because we realized that here's a, a architectural style that we're very interested in saving, and we put a lot of organizational effort behind it, and ultimately it wasn't a success. I know that modernism isn't always the most popular uh, form, and so we, we really started looking at why that is, um, explored that through. Uh, the magazine cover story, and then also looked at places where the uh, the love of modernism has really turned, turned into something that, that, that is allowed for the saving of buildings. Columbus, Indiana, uh, for example, is one of those places, uh, Lafayette Park in Detroit, um, and then you know, other so, sort of pockets throughout the United States where there's a good collection of modernist buildings and the people that live in those communities have really the style. Um, one of the reasons that I'm sure you all have also identified that 
uh, modernism isn't always uh, the most loved is because it's relatively new. Um, and often historic preservationists, especially members of the National Trust, tend to be an older demographic. Uh, we're certainly working hard to um, reach younger audiences, but many of our members, uh, our traditional members, are in fact older than some of the buildings that, that we're saying are now historic and need to be saved. So they have a memory as a child or even as a young adult of these places being built. Um, and for them, it wasn't the fashionable style, it was a new thing. And so, you know, getting over that sort of gray area as, as an organization and, and really as a movement um, it is the difficulties. Trying to convince people who didn't love the style when it was new um, that now it's historic and important. Um, as an example of that, I wanted to um, talk specifically or read actually from a letter. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's super long and, and, and kind of painful, um, but I, we got a lot of really positive and a lot of really negative uh, response to the article that featured Prentice. Um, the slide here says, for some, it's hard to love. Um, and here's an example of that. Uh, it says, Dear Editor Hockman, I wrote in protest. It is almost impossible to take seriously the comments of the President of the Trust um, in her meaningless praise for the brutalist buildings that have vandalized thousands of cities across America over the past five decades. The alarming rate of removal cited in your Hope for Modernism uh, story is an attempt to get us all to think that a terrible crime is being perpetrated on our environment. In fact, the buildings are being removed because we, the American people who have to live with them, have found the power to formally object to their existence and to repel attempts for similar buildings being built. Over and over again, it has been demonstrated that we don't want to sacrifice our towns and cities by subscribing to the argument that buildings should express creative and civic imagination. Um, it goes on and on and on um, in that vein. So uh, while we did get a lot of really positive feedback from people who wrote and said, oh, it was so great that you did that story, there's still a, a, a sort of vanguard of, of uh, his people who identify as historic preservationists who really don't like the modernist style. And so that really becomes the challenge for us as preservationists to try to figure out how to take something that is important um, to us as a society, imp important as an architectural style, and despite what this woman had to say, you know, an important uh, moment in our creative output at, at, as a as a culture, um, and and to get people to galvanize around those and figure out new ways of of using and living with these buildings. Uh, one of the successes that that we've had has actually been in. Houston. Here's the Astrodome here is on this uh, on this side. The Astrodome was one of our uh, national treasures. Uh, a little bit about national treasures, in case you don't know. National treasures are uh, the main campaign program of the National Trust. They're uh, historic and architecturally significant places um, that are endangered and that we feel, as an organization, uh, would be lost without our intervention. Um, in Houston, uh, there was a Proposition Two. Uh, and it would have asked a whopping, I don't know, fifteen, twenty dollars from each taxpayer or each taxpaying uh, uh, household uh, to save the building and, and repurpose it. And Proposition Two was voted down by Houston. But our actions on the ground actually galvanized uh, ten thousand people. Uh, we secured one hundred and eleven thousand votes to save uh, the Astrodome. Um, it's an important building. It was the first air-conditioned dome stadium. It was the first use of AstroTurf. It really revolutionized uh, the way stadiums were, were looked at. And the people of Houston, despite voting that measure down, have now really come together around the Astrodome. And in fact, Doco Momo is being held currently um, in Houston, and the Astrodome features prominently in the uh, in the programming of Doco Momo. So it, it's it's the story's not over, and we we're really able to get a groundswell of people um, there in Houston, engaging with us, engaging with the idea of saving modernism. Uh, in in a similar uh, way, uh, a little bit different. You know, there's also been a lot of support for Government Center in Orange County, New York. Um, there, actually, uh, the uh, 
I think it's the county executive or the or one of the sort of executive uh, leaders was against any sort of restoration or preservation of this building, wanted to tear it down. Uh, what happened is the legislator voted for preservation, and there's been a lot of really great support from individuals um, advocating also for preservation. And though the measure passed uh, through the legislature, there, there still is no uh, hard and fast uh, uh, outcome. We don't know what's going to happen, but uh, the, the, the steps are, are positive. Um, in St. Louis, uh, that was one of the communities that we looked at in our, in our modernism story. Uh, in, in the most recent issue of the magazine. Here's a place that was uh, you know, called the Flying Saucer lovingly by community members for years um, and a developer had purchased it and was going to demolish it and build something new and there was such unbelievable support from the community that he knew that the development would be a failure and people wouldn't support it after this place was demolished and something new built. So he spent somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half million extra dollars um, on the preservation because he got such um, support for the preservation project from the community. Ended up uh, being a uh, Starbucks and a Chipotle. And the interesting uh, aspect of this is uh, it kind of marks a shift in what historic preservation has meant for traditional historic preservationists. Um, even as, as uh, recent as 10, maybe 20 years ago, historic preservation solely meant going in and following the Secretary of the Interior standards and trying to match paints and preserving all of the interior details. Um, what we're realizing, especially with modernism, is that in many cases, these places, because they haven't been historic for long, they're only recently becoming historic, have been uh, modernized and adapted and changed over the years. So not a lot of the interior features remain anyway. Uh, but in order to successfully adapt and reuse these places, uh, people within the National Trust and other within the historic preservation movement are saying, you know, it's okay to change the interior. In some cases, completely gut it. Um, to do wholesale changes to the way the space functions inside in order to preserve, preserve the place itself. And this is a great example of that because the exterior um, still has the iconic saucer shape and the lighting, uh, but the interior is completely different. So that's a huge shift for the movement, uh, whereas historic preservationists or often known as the party of no, you, no you can't do this, no you can't do that, you must adhere to these standards. There's been a real loosening um, to the benefit of saving places like the saucer. Uh, another place that we're having a lot of success with um, is Miami Marine Stadium. One of the things we uh, talk about um, for successful historic preservation is uh, is the different pathways that people come to historic preservation. For some people, there's only one pathway. Uh, the woman who uh, wrote the letter that I described to you or read from earlier, um, her pathway is probably architecture. She loves old historic architecture, and that is the, the trigger that we need to pull to get her to save places. She's not interested in modernist architecture. She's not interested in the other aspects of historic places. But history is also a pathway uh, to historic preservation. Community building is a pathway to historic preservation and sustainability is a pathway for historic preservation. And one of the great things about the Miami Marine Stadium campaign that we're waging is that it really fills all of those pathways. So no matter why you are interested in historic preservation, Miami Marine Stadium has it. It has iconic architecture. It's got unbelievable history with the uh, you know, designed by a Cuban architect during a, a time of uh, Cuban uh, movement to the United States from, from, from Cuba as Castro came to power. Um, it also has a lot of history, different performers that were there, um, Elvis and Sammy Davis Jr. and Gloria Stefan and Jimmy Buffett. So there's a lot of memories that were built in this place. Um, it has a community building aspect because the future plans for Miami Marine Stadium will be all about creating a park and an entertainment venue and a destination for locals and tourists alike. 
And then, of course, the sustainability, which is inherent in all historic preservation, is that you're reusing a structure. I wanted to end with a story that is from a different issue that we did about two years ago. Uh, because it illustrates that while most of the places that we as an organization, National Trust, are interested in saving are uh, public and they're very large structures, they're, they're going to be intended for public use, that they're often a lot more challenging than houses. Houses are the easiest to save. Um, as a person who was quoted in the story, this was uh, two winters ago. Uh, this is an Ed Dart house outside of Chicago. And uh, someone quoted in this story said, you know, houses are often easiest to save because you, it only takes one person to love them. So you don't need to form a community. You don't need to have a $30 million campaign. You don't need to change the minds of natures. Uh, you just need to get one person to see the value of this. And uh, sort of a cute story with, with this house is uh, a family bought it, and, and the, uh, the husband and wife, looked at it as a teardown. It was a beautiful property uh, on a bluff overlooking Lake Michigan, the north side of Chicago, and they bought it strictly for the property. Uh, they had no interest in the house, and their 12-year-old daughter, upon visiting the house during one of the walkthroughs, said to the father, I can't believe you would want to tear this place down. It's so great. And just that love of, of this child started the parents thinking, you know, this really could be great, and they started thinking in a preservation way and turned it into a really sensational house. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, outline a, a little bit of what the National Trust is up to, some of the things that we're thinking about in the magazine, and certainly challenges and successes that uh, people are having saving modernism as, as a backdrop to what Chris is going to talk about. Does anyone have any questions before we jump to Chris? I, I take that to no, no one has any questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay, super. No, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so that uh, you're not getting feedback from my end. Oops. Am I on? I don't know. Can everybody hear me? Nod. Yes. <laughs> I am new at this technology. I'm going to talk about, um, I'll do my screen share, a little bit about saving the modern century. And now I can't see if you're nodding or not. I'm going to assume everything's okay unless Sarah emails me. So what I've been doing for a long time now is talking about modern architecture and how we can save this modern architecture, I found out some interesting things about how we look at the past and how we look at the future. And I think it can help us. Uh, this is usually all of us, the modernist, uh, three martinis at lunch, and then we're off in Palm Springs or here's LA looking at our modern. Um, one of the things that we've missed as preservationists, I think, are there some preservation tools which involve key issues and some myth-busting uh, that we need to look at more carefully. So what we really want to do is change the way we think about historic architecture and how we do uh, historic preservation in the 21st century. Because I think we've forgotten that we are leaving the 20th century far behind already. Um, if we don't imagine our future, somebody else will, and that's usually this bulldozer future that I've seen far too often. So if you're thinking about historic preservation, I went to a conference and a futurist actually challenged us to think about the year 2066, and it was actually it was pretty funny because no everybody was speechless. Nobody had actually uh, thought about it. So if you think 100 years from the founding of the National Historic Preservation Act, which is only 52 years from now, something like uh, Frank Gehry's uh, buildings will be 50 years old. 
Well, how are we going to work as preservationists? Uh, I think our methods are sound and everything, but we have to adjust the way that we think about the buildings. So I want to do some reframing. Uh, you know, if we're talking about why is modernism important, these are some things that, that I think would be useful for us to do, which is not to say why is saving modern or modernism important, but instead reframing that and saying why is saving historic 20th century buildings important and not bifurcating the 20th century into pre-50, post-1950 doesn't provide enough context. Uh, you know, we're getting closer and closer, actually, to 2050. We're closer to 2050 than we are to 1950. And each time we, we go through these years, I have to keep changing my PowerPoint, um, you know, something built in 1964 is now 50 years old. But when we get to 2025, we're looking at everything after 1975 and so on. Um, but, and what we want to do is to promote this idea, like Vincent Scully talked about, which was uh, architecture is a conversation between the generations carried out across time. In this picture, I have uh, a picture of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, which was just built in Los Angeles, and the old Victorian house is being moved out of the way. So each one of these generations has their own idea of what is architecture. But how do we keep this going and save the buildings that are coming, including brutalism? I was interested to hear that quote about brutalism and how, how could you possibly defend that. So a lot of it is our own biases are impacting our success in preservation projects. Uh, for um, many, many years, <laughs> preservationists before us, you know, our own forefathers and mothers of preservation, hated modernism. Modernism is what replaced their Victorian buildings, their Art Deco buildings, and so they talked about modernism and it should be demolished. I still know um, preservationists in San Francisco who would never uh, fight for the, you know, the pyramid uh, building there because that pyramid building, which is from the 70s, replaced a lot of older Victorian buildings. And then this kind of thing that comes out in the paper about Paul Rudolph's Orange County Government Center, Brutalist, you know, are some buildings too ugly to survive? So we rely on these shortcuts. Uh, here's one, Don Ripkema and Jean Lambin had a famous uh, tiff about which is more important. Is it, Mount, is it Mount Vernon or is it McDonald's? I think these uh, arbitrary kind of comparisons actually take us back a step and keep us busy, too busy, arguing amongst ourselves when we should be looking for other ways to succeed. What I like to talk about is that modernism is American architecture of the 20th century. Oops. So uh, this is a diagram that was drawn for me for uh, architects from Boston showing just a snippet of buildings constructed between 1951 and 1975. It includes Miami, Miami Marine Stadium, includes the Cyclorama, which was demolished, Marcel Breuer, that was demolished, it includes the Prentice Hospital, demolished. A lot of these have been demolished. And so you can see as we lose each one of these, we are losing integral parts of this American architectural story from this period. And modernism is actually what the 20th century was all about. Even if you go all the way back to World War I, their modernism starts in the United States uh, very early in the 20th century in California. This is a Hawaii example. This is Minnesota. Uh, here's Los Angeles. And then this is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This, the architecture is across the country and in every imaginable size, shape, and form. So it is uh, very important to preserve this. And the other thing that we do is we talk about, well, if it's not old enough, it's not 50 years old, or it's not this, it, you know, it hasn't reached that point, which is really a detriment to saving modernism. So what I prefer is to think about is what is historic versus just what is old. You'll hear that from your um, from critics and skeptics, you know, it's it just because it's old doesn't mean it should be saved. 
Well, this is an example of something that is not that old, which is the uh, condominium where President Obama lived in Honolulu. Why? It is, I can make an architecturally significant argument for it, but more importantly, it is the, it's a presidential home, and every presidential home is um, preserved and interpreted. So how are we going to, how are we going to work this in to the American story? So embracing multiple perspectives is like this is going to be imperative for the future success of preservation. So that I tend to work off of these four arguments, which is economic, historic, generational, and contextual. And really, if one doesn't work, I use the next one. And if that doesn't work, I use a combination. So you really have to be pliable uh, to work with modernism. Um, I'm going to talk just a tiny bit about the economic argument and using Palm Springs as an example. Uh, William Kolpeck was going to join us, but uh, was unable to today. Uh, in 2010, when I was with the National Trust, we actually provided funding for Modernism Week to um, have a visitor survey. Uh, Palm Springs is a, you know, a mid-century era type town in uh, near Los Angeles, and they even though you might say, oh, Palm Springs, everybody knows it's modern, they still have trouble with sometimes the city understanding that modernism is important. So how do you prove to a city that modernism is economically contributing to the, you know, the value of your town? So what we did was we did a post-event visitor survey and looked. These are the type of buildings you see in Palm Springs. I highly recommend that you go, people are already planning a trip for next year. But what we found out through this survey was that attendance had gone up every year, and already this is already four years old, and it's, it was even bigger the last year I was just there. But it went up 76%. This is the number of visits from people to Palm Springs for this 10-day event. This is the kind of number that changes the minds of city council. <clears throat> More importantly is this economic impact, showing that in 2010, almost $5 million was generated in terms of spending by the people who came to visit uh, Modernism Week. This uh, survey actually went much further and talked, you know, how many people came, where did they come from. There was actually a large Australian contingent that comes to Palm Springs every year for this event, and we were able to track that using this survey. I was just there, and this is a, a shot from the tour. And so using your modernism uh, in a way that you can show the city actually makes money for your city. Every city wants to know what's valuable. In the end, a lot of preservation, unfortunately, is really about economic um, interest. You know, is it going to be important to save it for the economy? And in a lot of cases for modernism, definitely, yes, it can help. This is a view of, a, of that modern ranch house. That's the view on the left is the outside, and the view on the right is the inside, showing how the, the modernists were using these green principles in Palm Springs to keep the, the doorway shaded. Uh, another economic idea that would help us with preservation is if you look through the US Census in your free time, you'll see that they have interesting uh, numbers like this one. These are the commercial buildings in the U.S. as of 1989. The, this is the, when I did this, this is the most recent numbers available actually. So everyone will say to you, well we can't save everything from the 50s, but if you keep looking you see the 1960s and then you see the number of structures built in the 70s is, the, is actually quite large. We have to address every one of these periods as we go forward in preservation. And we really haven't touched uh, the 70s. How are we going to address it, much less the 80s? You know, how are we going to address the 80s? We need to keep looking forward and being prepared with new arguments. Something that's coming up right now are these aging critical facilities. I saw a lot of this in California where all of, everything was built at the same time. It's like you bought all your shoes and all your, you know, your dresses in the same year and then they all wear out in the same year. 
so so many post offices, hospitals, police stations, city halls, schools were all built during this post World War II expansion, and all of those buildings are wearing out at the same time. So we're losing enormous numbers of post offices and hospitals and schools. Schools are actually the worst because uh, of changes for security. The old open style school does not work. And so they're hard to adapt, but instead they're being demolished. Uh, what we're losing are some of these diverse stories. So this would be a contextual argument that you can use for saving modernism. And mostly it's that people really don't know what they're looking at until you start looking at the stories behind these buildings. And it's very important to do your research and to uh, look at this historic context. This is just an example. This is the Gettysburg Cyclorama. The National Park Service uh, should have saved it but did not. But this is what the building looked like when we tried to save it. It was really in bad condition. So this is what a regular visitor would see when they'd see the Cyclorama. This is what the building used to look like and this is what I saw when I saw the Cyclorama. So I knew there was a bigger story behind this building and there was. Here's another example. This is actually Space Mountain at Disney World. I live in Orlando now and I get to meet a lot of interesting people. Uh, what I found out was this is actually the oldest operating roller coaster in Florida. Opened in 1975. Be extremely significant, I would think, for that. Um, the Zephyr Surf Shop here is a 1972, uh, just a vernacular commercial building, actually is the birthplace of modern skateboarding. So this is a historic context, yet it's a modern building as the background. And this one is actually, I believe it was nominated as a National Historic Landmark. This is the what we call the birthplace of hip hop. And the National Trust covered this in one of the foreign journals. This is, you know, a modern era public housing. And most people would say that can't possibly be significant for any reason. But there is this context, this diverse story, which is behind modernism. This is one that I used to work, uh, I used to fool people with this. It doesn't work as much anymore because now people know where it is. Um, but the ranch house is actually um, extremely important. And people, and people say, why would that be important? Vernacular Ranch of California, there's millions of these. But it was actually where Apple Computer was founded in 1970 in the garage. And I think that this one was just listed as a, as a historic site recently. So we have this tech background, this tech history. And then um, lastly, for context, I've been doing um, more research on the race uh, and African American history of modernism, and that many modernist structures were built as um, desegregated environment for children in the 1950s and the 1960s. This was actually, this school in Louisiana was built as, a, as an African American only school. Other schools were not. Um, this one was, of course, in Dangerous Phyllis Wheatley Elementary. That's where those little children were studying. And I love this picture because it has everybody in front of a modern building. They care about it just as much as you'd see an old post office back there from a vintage photo. But of course, it didn't quite work and the building was demolished. So, um, Christy McClear, who was the director of the Glass House, uh, had mentioned that modernism drives the need for a Gen 2 preservation movement. And I really think this is the moment where people who want to move forward with preservation can really do it. Uh, there's this whole idea about making wiser choices for preservation in terms of this regeneration. And a lot of that is accepting adaptations to the buildings while preserving the original intent and celebrating history. So part of that is focusing on how the building does work rather than how it doesn't work. And you'll hear that from skeptics, like the building just can't accommodate new HVAC. We cannot possibly update it. Nobody thinks about how can the building work and, and move from that direction instead. 
So, you know, Prentice, which was, I think, is being demolished actually right now, has huge effort um, to save that building, including some maybe pretty shocking ideas about how to renovate the structure. But what we need to do is think about these seriously and start to maybe accommodate some of these what you previously would say, there's actually no way we're doing that to this building. Maybe that is the way we need to move a little bit, especially with modern structures. This is the University of Utah College of Architecture and Planning, uh, kind of like a half brick, half brutalist hybrid. It was a net zero rehab project that the students themselves worked on. And this kind of thing, you know, where everyone says it's ugly, it's been very cyclical. You know, the old post office pavilion in D.C., everybody wanted to tear that down in the 1970s. It was a big campaign to save it because nobody liked Roman mess at that time. Then, of course, Art Deco went through an entire period where everything was being demolished, and that was saved and is now much beloved. So my last point is we, I think we should banish this term architectural eyesore because it really works to our disadvantage. And when I say this, people say, oh, I never use that term. And I say, well, let's talk about brutalism because so many people I hear, you know, oh, I love the 50s, but I hate the 70s. And what happens is that kind of penetrates uh, public thinking when architectural and preservation professionals talk that way. This is Orlando Public Library with some of our you know, recent visitors from the Death Star here. But people actually like brutalism. So what I found out is the same way that I was raised with all modern buildings in Los Angeles is some people, like maybe from Boston or Chicago, where everything was brutalist and they really enjoy it. For real. So this guy is with Arcanec. They do sell this t shirt, I Heart Brutalism. And um, I've saw a picture of this couple actually use this for their engagement photo in front of the brutalist uh, that Orlando Public Library. So Michael Allen had a good quote. I'm going to close with that. The demolition should be a last option and not a first response. And I think that we should always use that as our guiding principle as we talk about um, preservation and especially with modernism. Back to you. Any questions? I don't know how I would hear anybody's questions, but maybe they could send me in chat. Andy, I can't hear you. <laughs> How about Stan? Do you have any questions? I guess I have a question going back to kind of back to the Astrodome. It's how what methods can we use to start motivating people to get active, to actually make a decision, to get involved in saving the structures? Um, so how how do we get that motivation out there? Right. Well, you know, I just what motivated me was I was just angry. So I don't know if that works for other people. But what really happened was um, uh, every building that I was studying was being torn down, and I knew that they weren't using the correct facts to talk about the building, the people who wanted to demolish it. So really, I think I was motivated by you know, correcting the record. You know, I think whatever it is, if it's your old drive-in, then and you went there as a kid, and that's why you want to act, I think just get out there. A lot of preservation successes have really been due to one person leading the charge, and that's what's really important. And so from the National Trust perspective, um, we're obviously not one person leading the charge. We're, we're, it, we're not so much acting because of, of, of the frustration. It's more of a concerted effort. And um, in the same issue as the, the modernism cover story, my editor's note, I talked about the different kinds of people who are preservationists. So you all are going to school for historic preservation. Um, 
you probably hope to become professional preservationists. But our audience at the National Trust, our members, are 150,000 people who don't have many, many of whom don't have educational or academic backgrounds in architecture or historic preservation. But many of them consider them preservationists nonetheless. And so one of the ways that we engage them is we have a fairly robust marketing team. The magazine is part of that. And we tell stories of these places. A lot of the things that Chris was talking about um, through her presentation is these histories, the, the, the diverse stories, evoking those diverse stories and, and creating a passion for these places by showing it's not just a building that may be considered ugly or, or, or not fashionable currently, but it's a place that harbors this unbelievable history of these moments that we can all share. That engages a lot of people to say, oh, that is an important place. So I guess building off of that, um, Christine had that great slide about showing what decade of commercial buildings are being used currently. And um, she mentioned that we are even considering buildings that were built in the 80s. Um, but we're going to be continuing to face this problem of preserving our recent past. So do we need to start thinking even more in the future than we are now? Um, so it seems to be very reactionary still. So how can we be more proactive? Well, I think that's pretty tough. It's, so something built right now would be 50 years old by the 100th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act. And most of the stuff that we see being built today, we all frown and say, oh, that's an awful you know, Mediterranean McMansion mix-up. But um, you know, I've kind of only half joked, and I could probably find the uh, first couple of McMansion developments and that those probably be historic on some level. I bet you they're from early 1970s, mid 1970s. How are we going to deal with that? You know, when I said that, like, you know, there's the first 16 Kmart's opened across the country as the first set of the suburban uh, big box. Would those be important? No, oh, absolutely not. So we can't even look at that period without scowling. I'm not sure how we can move forward unless we um, kind of change our perspective. Um, I have a question and kind of an observation between some of the ideas that uh, was mentioned in your um, presentation about um, and what you were saying about stimulating those emotions because you're angry you want to preserve something. So that's these emotions, these um, high emotions that we have to want to preserve. Then also, uh, what I think Dennis was saying about um, human stories and engaging people to um, get behind the issue through these stories. Uh, how uh, I was thinking this could be a way to help this. I think you called it the generation or Gen Two or regeneration of getting people behind preserving modernism or the historic 20th century buildings. So could that could that be a key idea of? How to stimulate this new way or idea of preserving is creating more, um, advertising more of these human stories or the emotional side to get people behind modernism that they may have not thought twice of when it was first built because that was just the new building that was being built. Um, what do you think of that idea of a new way to get? The new ideas of preservation for the modern or the 20th century buildings. Is that for me or for Dennis? Either one. <laughs> Dennis, you want to go first? I was actually having a little bit of a hard time picking up on exactly. I was getting some feedback. I don't know if you were, Chris. Um, so I think if you heard the, correctly, you might answer first. Sure. <laughs> I picked up enough. I picked up enough. It is hard to hear. Um, but it's about the Gen 2 preservation movement, right? So and how do we get you know, more people excited about that, in a sense? I think um, that's a tough question. I think we have to really, it's the same for me, you have to stop being judgmental. So when I say to somebody, uh, you know, I remember all my friends said, we want to save the first McDonald's. And now, jeez, you know, Rip Kama went crazy. Absolutely not. And so how do we expect, and I was kind of insulted because, you know, I spent a lot of my childhood at the early McDonald's, so I thought they were important. So how are we going to embrace this? So, you know, kids come in, 
And kids, I mean people in their 20s, say, I'd like to preserve a shopping mall. And they're like, oh, geez, that is shopping malls, no way. And then the, the media, they leave, and they go somewhere else. And the other problem is that it's a um, typical generational issue. It's, we don't know how to talk each other's language. So I would not, as always, you know, I'm okay on social media, but I don't do, I'm kind of old days now, I don't do Instagram or Vine or I don't know what the new thing is. You know, I'm all old-fashioned Facebook, right? So how are we going to keep Gen 2 interested if we can't talk in the language that they need? Yeah, so um, I, I, I think I understand what you were looking for a little bit more. And, it, and again, I'm, I'm going to go back to a note that I've already played, but there's so many different kinds of preservationists, and so much of preservation is getting that word out um, and letting people know why these places are important, but also understanding what's important to them. So in the National Trust, we do a lot of research on up-and-coming generations, people who are who maybe not interested in historic preservation now, but we know they will be in 10, 20, 30 years. What's important to them now? What are the places that are going to resonate to, with them when they're older? We need to start figuring that out now. Otherwise, it's going to be too late when they're in danger. This is Andy at the National Trust, and I'd like to ask a question to the students. Um, Dennis and Christine have presented a variety of different types of modernist buildings, and you've seen the diversity of that, and you've seen that some are significant for many different reasons, be it the architectural style or their place in history. So my question to you is, what about what these buildings that you've seen or buildings that are in Savannah or the your hometowns speak to you and what about this type of architecture for you personally has meaning? I think um, for me personally it's more so that these modernist structures are with, with them being closer and more recent past then we can associate and have a stronger connection to them than we do with the historic property that was built 150 years ago, or let's just say someone from our, you know, our parents' earlier generation. Um, so a modernist building is something that we can associate with closer, uh, but as a historic preservationist and studying you know, traditionalism with, within historic preservation, um, I think that it's something that ideally in the future that different curricula will be involving more modernism and modernist classes. Now this, this is Seth, uh, I agree. I think it is for me at least personal connection. Um, perhaps to re resources that Maybe I shouldn't talk. Um, <laughs> personal connection to resources that are at least within a, a slightly more imaginable past. Um, not to say that Mount Vernon isn't interesting, um, but I, I just feel more of a connection to to a Boston City Hall, to the Orange County um, government facility. Right, but that's exactly it. So that's your connection, and I think. Chris, I had a question for you. Okay, Seth. <laughs> What's your question? Yeah? No? Go ahead. Uh, Chris, my question for you. Sorry. Um, I, I was just, well, I really guess really anyone. Um, I think one big thing that always has struck me in talking to people about modern architecture is uh, almost the fixation on this 50-year rule, which is not a rule. Uh, and so I guess I would just kind of introduce as a discussion topic the idea of perhaps working with um, National Register staff to um, change, lower, eliminate um, that that number since that seems to be so often a sticking point for, for so many people and uh, as you were saying Chris uh, really it's it's the contextual history um, for any building uh, structure, site, object that's going to make it uh, historic. Uh, can I tell you what I've heard about 50 years? 
Sure. What I heard was I actually think we'd be more effective changing local uh, regulations and making those less than 50 for the National Register. I've heard that it's unlikely they'll change it, and it's because there's so many military buildings that would then fall under some smaller, it would just be a, a huge um, governmental paperwork nightmare. This is the rumor I hear that I'll share with you. And so that might be part of it. And besides, um, you're going to have a lot more uh, ability to save a building with local and state nomination, or less than 50. So I know there are a number of cities who have less than 50, and that works a little better, I think. So um, yeah. I'd also like to address that a, a little bit. Um, we've been talking a lot about that here at the National Trust, um, what we do about the, the National Register, if it's something that we want to try to have an effect on, if there's something we want to try to change. Um, right now, as it stands, there's uh, a lot of you know, the, the, the Secretary of the Interior Standards are, are tough to meet, and they're required for things like federal tax credits. Um, so, you know, none of this is really ready for prime time because we haven't made any official decisions on it, but one of the things that we talk about is, okay, yeah, maybe the Secretary's standards are something that need to apply to a certain category of building that that you know you can look at it and say it's got the cultural history, it's got the you know the diversity, it's got the astounding architecture from a pedigreed architect, all these sort of things. But for your most you know significant historic buildings that are nice that we want to protect, maybe there's a different sort of standard that gets used. So it is something that um, I don't know that we want to have an effect on, but I agree that uh, you know, on a state and local level, um, it's something you can have an effect on. We have a, a story, it's a perfect example, um, that's coming out in, in our next issue of the magazine. It's an old machine shop in Baltimore, and it got both state and local tax credits, and it did not get federal tax credits because it wouldn't have qualified. But for all intents and purposes, it's a preservation success. It's been turned into a design school that is loved by the community, that it's been embraced by the design community, and is now being used by uh, Baltimore children from 27 different zip codes as a, as a magnet school for, for design learning. And it's being used as an example of design, a, a sort of place where they can go and learn design skills in a place that adheres to them. So, you know, I think there's there, there's a loosening of, of those standards, um, maybe not necessarily the 50-year-old rule, but just in the way we look at historic preservation, in the same way that preservationists in St. Louis were able to encourage saving the saucer, even though it wasn't preserving all the interior details. Can I bring up a question about the, uh, the flying saucer? Um, you were talking about um, how that was considered a success because you know it maintained a lot of the integrity um, on the exterior, but then you said that the interior was adapted to um, fit better with the Starbucks and Chipotle. Um, modern architecture, so much of the design, including not only the architecture, but also the interior, as well as the site and most often the furniture and furnishings inside, it's an overall design. So um, when you're thinking about saving modernist architecture, should you be thinking about all that whole, you know, everything together, and so that it doesn't lead to facadism or other, just saving the shell. So I go, can you hear me? Um, I think you should always have the 100% preservation in mind, but in a practical sense, it's not always going to be. So I will always start at the absolute top and not give in, and then if, if there's two, if it's just not going to work, then start coming down from there. And Kenny, going off of your question and what you heard um, just how you answer it, how does, sorry, it froze a little bit. Were you still talking? No, it's okay. The thing keeps 
kind of you know, cutting out, so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was wondering how it deals with, you mentioned that was kind of modernism, and that kind of goes along with what Carl was saying, this kind of whole contextual idea of um, modernism and modern buildings, but with the Mike Saucer, you took, you um, changed the interior, but kept the exterior mm -hmm. intent. So how, how can you balance that and, and address those issues of retaining the integrity of the intent? Who knows about flying saucer? I didn't talk about that. Well, it can be about any modern building. Really. Any modern? I mean, I... <laughs> I've seen that flying saucer. I think we should save what we can and do what we can. I mean, I'm actually thinking about, I've moved a, a Victorian building across the lake here in Florida, and now I'm thinking maybe it's not a bad idea to move a building. I know it's controversial, but I'd rather move it than lose it, basically. But I think there are a lot of conversations going on in terms of um, uh, developing elevation guidelines for buildings and trying to figure out how can you still maintain a state, a national, or a local listing and elevate a building so that it survives but yet yeah, accommodate um, maybe rising rising sea level or, or other climate changes. Right, exactly. exactly. All right, we've got time for one more question. Uh, SCAD students, do you have anything else uh, that you've got there that you're curious about? All right, well, then I'm going to finish by asking you a question. Sure. Tell me, based on what you've heard today and what you've seen with the presentation, is there anything that you've seen that has surprised you based on the, um, about modernism or that particularly struck you as surprising about just what's out there and what the current state of affairs are and what the future outlook is for these kinds of buildings? Yeah, um, I think that that slide, and I, I think it was Christine's slide, that she showed the pie graph that actually gave the, um, the roll-up of all of the buildings combined, with, you know, from 1984 or 9, I believe. But just seeing the numbers and how heavily weighted they are within, you know, the 80s, 70s, and 60s, kind of a wake-up call to really see exactly where we need to be aligning a lot of our resources and, you know, dedication within preservation. And interesting that it was, I think that side was dealing with commercial buildings. Right, too. yeah, so yeah. That, that focus was heavily weighted in those decades and that, that those will be our concerns right. in the near future. Yeah. Yeah, I also found it very surprising. I mean, I guess I didn't put it two and two together that, you know, a lot of these buildings post-World War II were built around the same time, and now they're all experiencing, you know, um, problems at the same time all over the country, and, you know, it's this giant effort nationwide then to save a whole period of buildings at the same time instead of over time as they, you know, generate problems. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably have that same thing again in about 30 years because we're building all new school buildings right, right. now. So then what are we going to do with these buildings built today? That's how we need to start thinking. And maybe we'll learn some lessons from dealing with all the modern buildings that are coming, needing to be um, maintained and fixed for buildings that we're building today. Right. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everyone for participating. This has been a really great discussion, and I think we've raised some really great points that have been certainly beneficial for us here at the Trust. So thank you to the students. Thank you to Christine and everyone who's listening in in cyberspace. Uh, this has been really great. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.